Next up, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, released for the Super NES four years later. This particular outing takes the formula of the first NES century and expands upon it by the shit ton. Way to pull off an epic ass 180 there, Nintendo. That said, M. Defala, you have the floor. Set prior to the first two installments we've just discussed, hence a prequel, there exists a mythical plane, aka parallel world, known as the Golden Land, aka the Sacred Realm, within which the Sacred Triforce lies. Created and conceived by the three golden goddesses, along with Hyrule no less, the inhabitants of the latter address kingdom have been tirelessly struggling and sacrificing their asses for god knows how many years in an attempt to make their dearest wishes come true with that very same Triforce. However, more cataclysmic occurrences and brutal, incessant wars have transpired due to the Golden Land's evil energy being emitted resulting in its portal being opened. Thus, the seven wise men were summoned to once and for all cease the activities and permanently seal said portal by pooling and fusing their magic together. Oh, where have I heard that one before? Oh, Jewel Master Mudge? Anyways, generations later, a more conventional strategy was devised in order to reopen that very same portal to the Golden Land. Enter Aghanim, or Aghanim, Ganon's pawn for the record, a treacherous pissant wizard hellbent on meeting a aforementioned objective by streamlining his unassailable procedure. What does it entail, one might ask? Upon gaining the trust of the good-natured King of Hyrule, or attempting to gain, the heartless, dildo-choking son of a bitch resorts to the unthinkable. Not only does he cremate the ever-loving shit out of the ruler, he and his followers waste absolutely no time shanghaiing the Seven Maidens, who, by the way, are descendants of those very same sages, one of whom includes Princess Zelda herself, no less, and utilizing their powers to bridge together both Hyrule's Light World and the Golden Land's Dark World, thus sealing their precious asses in hidden crystals guarded within select locations of the latter dimension. Therefore, who could have guessed? Links out once again to set things right by taking on and meeting each new goal, starting with a telepathic message from the princess herself, as depicted here. Gameplay-wise, if you will, I'm to follow. Superseding the same trademark top view exploration and action adventure RPG elements from the very first outing, aka one of its canonical successors, Link's latest odyssey ensues when his uncle departs in an attempt to rescue the ever so iconic titular princess, whose obvious result we'll see in a little. Upon hopping his little ass out of bed, there's a colossal mind blowing deal of continuity hints that transpire as he not only gets in touch with his rebellious side, in terms of infringing his uncle's commands to stay home, that is, starting with revealing various aiding objects. Namely, the lamp. Hauling ass for Hyrule Castle via a secret underground passage, only to find out that, seriously, his uncle being plummeted to near defeat, hence his endowment of the sword and shield to our young protagonist. As he storms through the castle, complete with countless run-ins with the inexorable as fuck guards, In no time, Link rescues Princess Zelda from within its dungeon chamber, leading to yet another pilgrimage, this time involving the usual backtracking. and a reunion with the priest at the sanctuary. It's at this precise milestone when Zelda informs Link that he must unearth the Master Sword, the Blade of Evil's Bane, in order to thwart the efforts of and finish off that ass-licking, smegma-peeling, dodongo fucking bastard dark sorcerer Aganum before the wise man's seals are broken and most of Hyrule goes to complete shit. By finding and recovering the three pendants of virtue in their corresponding Hylian dungeon labyrinths, Courage, Power, and Wisdom, located within the Eastern Palace, the Desert Palace to the Southwest, and the Tower of Hera atop Death Mountain to the North, individually. And this, ladies and gents, is where the majority of the Odyssey delves deeper and further. Once again, it's almost the same spiel as the very first original NES installment, but with a shit ton of drastic improvements and cutting-edge features applied and reinforced beyond comprehension. 
Link can now traverse anywhere in eight directions unlike the previous two, and especially up and down stairs. Not just on any solid ground, attack just like a normal sword in a 150 degree arc pattern with the B button, in the style of Willow for the NES by Capcom we might add, and perform the mighty all new 360 degree whirling blade by holding that same button down and releasing it for a second or two, which for the record trumps Link's normal slashes. Lift up and chuck pots and bushes with the A button, also used for opening chests and conversing with NPC villagers slash inhabitants, amongst other relevant abilities. Y permits Link the availment of his secondary items, weapons, magic, whenever appropriate. And here's the big saving grace. X grants instant access to the overworld map of Hyrule, both far away and close up, in conjunction with the D-pad. And goddamn, is it more detailed and recognizable than ever before. And the same applies whenever you're in a dungeon labyrinth, except with different layouts. Not only do both maps pinpoint your current location, but also indicate where the hell to go next, assuming that you've conversed with the right key characters beforehand, and even display which floors you're on and those you have yet to explore in the latter case. L and R are used to swap the view of the overworld map, if nothing else, and Start grants access to your inventory list and basic button-based abilities, and Select either lets you continue your current quest or save, complete with halting said quest, and a one-way ticket back to the opening titles. Just like before, Link's inventory consists of not only the lamp, acquired from the chest within his house at the beginning, used for lighting up braziers and dungeons, thus deducting a small portion of his magic meter, which can be refilled at any time with small or large vials, but also the usual boomerang, found in the Hyrule Castle basement, bows and arrows, found in the first dungeon, the Eastern Palace, with the latter being available for purchase at shops, and bombs, now in two types, the original, this time used to chuck at distant enemies after setting them, and the all-new Super Bomb, obtained after completing a later dungeon. As for the new items to discover and or purchase, there's these empty glass bottles Link acquires from a merchant in the Kakariko Village, and in other locations no less, to store not only three new medicinal potions for moments of necessity, one for his health in red, another for his magic in green, and the third for both stats meshed together, in blue, hence the cure-all medicine, but also the trademark instant life recovery fairies after trapping them with the bug-catching net, obtained from a sick kid in that very same village. Hell, those very same fairies can resurrect Link from death if it's still trapped within. Gee willikers, talk about handy dandy! The Pegasus Boots, obtained from the Elder Saws, Rala, in the Haunted Grove, following your completion of the Eastern Palace Pursuit for the Courage Pendant, allowing Link to perform a driving dash attack, not to mention enhance his overall speed. Sonic, move the hell over! Hard pieces for extending Link's overall lifespan upon finding and combining all four, just like with the heart containers, obviously, this time up to a possible 20 hearts. The Power Glove? Not to be confused with that infamous yet expensive piece of shit NES accessory by Mattel of Intellivision, Hot Wheels, He-Man, and Barbie fame for lifting heavier objects, likewise with the later enhanced version, the Titan's Mid, the Moon Pearl? Okay, not going there. Obtained in the Tower of Hera atop Death Mountain for keeping Link's true Hylian form intact while in the Dark World, despite accidentally transforming into a rabbit when exposed to any dark sorcery, and even the Book of Mudora for translating any and all Hylian statements found in the library south of Kakariko Village after knocking it off the top of one of its shelves with your Pegasus boots. Getting back to the Elder Saas Rala, you can telepathically communicate with them, and especially Princess Zelda, through the tiles in each dungeon about any specific hints on how to proceed. In addition to unearthing the Master Sword itself, discovered in the Lost Woods after recovering the three pendants, as mentioned earlier, his next enhanced main weapon, which emits beams when Link's at full health, likewise with his later sword enhancements, which by the way, is mandatory before confronting a Ganymede. Other accessories and weapons include the fire and ice rods, used for casting their corresponding elements at the cost of a slightly greater degree of his magic meter, the former of which is also used for the illuminating braziers aside from the lamps, discovered in both the Skull Woods and within a hidden frigid area of a cave near the northern shores of Lake Hylia, respectively. Same with the Magic Cape, which protects Link from any and all hazard collisions while invisible, thus deducting a few ounces of Link's magic meter per second. The Canes of Berna and Somaria, the former of which executes the same task, whereas the latter summons blocks for assorted purposes, most notably designing larger platforms and activating switches from a distance, like the statues in every dungeon, and are both used to beat the bejesus- Beat the bejesus? Or like rape the bejesus out of Link's foes! The Magic Powder, brewed by Syrup the Witch outside her shop to the east from a mushroom found in the Lost Woods, great against even the most obscure and annoying adversaries. We're looking at you, Buzz Blobs and Anti-Fairies. The Magic Mirror, obtained from the lost old man atop Death Mountain after leading him out of its cave, effective for warping between both the light and dark worlds. Just be mindful of where you warp, because Link will pop up inadvertently near a wall or unsuspecting area. 
Hell, secret warp portals can be found under stones for much safer getaways. Zola's flippers for better swimming capabilities, available for purchase in his aquatic domain to the northeast for 500 rupees. The magic hammer for knocking out enemies and barricades with the toughest defenses, with which even your sword can't do piss all. Discovered in the first Dark World dungeon, the Dark Palace. A shovel for digging, donated by the flute player in the Dark World's haunted grove, and his flute, found in the very same location in the Light World after warping. Used for easier travels to any and all previously embarked areas. And how can we possibly forget the kick-ass hookshot found within the Swamp Palace for not only traversing over gaps, but also wiping enemies out and procuring faraway dropped items which Link can't even reach for shit. The blue and red males, both of which work in the same way as the rings in the first game, you know, reducing Link's damage output by their individual fractions. The mirror shield found within Turtle Rock Dungeon for deflecting even the toughest projectiles. And the dominating earth-shattering magic medallions, Etherquake and Bombos, for annihilating and straight-up castrating, no rhyme intended, tougher and more gargantuan swarms of adversaries, and even making your boss confrontations more of a walk in the goddamn park. Well, for the record, the latter three discovered atop Death Mountain with the use of the Book of Mudora, the southern portion of the Dark World, namely within the Lake of Ill Omen, thanks to the catfish after throwing a stone skull in his private pond, and within the Desert of Mystery, again using the Book of Mudora, singularly, use up an enormous shitload of your magic meter, in which case be sure to stock up on your potions beforehand, or just grind your ass off for more vials. While the majority of Link's overall inventory items function just the way many would expect, others can be enhanced by throwing them into wishing wells after sacrificing 100 rupees. Again, be mindful of which item you intend to surrender, most notably the later sword enhancements, your introductory shield, or the bow and arrows. Or in the Master Sword's case, having it recrafted and tempered by the blacksmiths. And as always, Christ in a pool of his own mixed urine and blood, swimming around in nothing but a half-torn sequin jumpsuit while having three riot clubs shoved halfway up his ass. You'll need each of these accessories as soon as you can possibly find the means to discover and or purchase them. So, what types of new threats lurk about the Hylian Realm? I don't know. Every, Every motherfucking thing. thing. Starting with color and weapon varied castle soldiers, especially the more resilient gray and gold mini boss troops sporting a ball and chain. The vast majority of foes, depending on which area of Hyrule you're on, or in for that matter, including their corresponding dimension neutral dungeon chambers, runs the gamut from rats, the traditional keys and ropes, octoroks, and tektites, Armo statues, porters, aka the Telltale Bushcrawlers, Unsuspecting Thieves, Zolas, Desert Crows and Vultures, Buzz Blobs, Igors and Gorias, the former of which are vulnerable only when their peepers are open, just like the Gomas. Stalfos, Barris and Beeries, <coughs> that would be Baris and Beeries, Terror Pins, Hard Hat Beetles, Slimes and Sand Crabs, Anti Fairies, Pen Gators, Hawk Box, the list goes on and on, including the return of those godforsaken Wall Masters. <laughs> Likewise with the hazards, including boulders atop Death Mountain, the cannonballs in the Eastern Palace, small and king-sized, diminutive, silver and giant gold blade traps, bumpers in the Tower of Hera, and the Dark Palace random flying tiles that can either be avoided or deteriorated and must be cleared out before proceeding. Whack-a-mole barriers, wiped out with only the magic hammer, BMO statues, whose beams pack serious goddamn wallops, as do the wall-eye lasers in Turtle Rock Dungeon and Ganon's Tower. The lightning lock at Hyrule Castle, Sparks, both singular and in longer rotating rod formations a la Super Mario Brothers, unsuspecting crevices, all of which will make you damn near cry foul if you're not on your toes every step of the fucking way. And don't even get us started with the massively coked up and roided to the max dungeon bosses either. The six Armos Knights at the end of the Eastern Palace, the three Landmolas at the end of the Desert Palace, and the infamous yet massively evolved Moldorm atop the Tower of Hera, the latter of which, if your strategies aren't on point, despite having a wall down which you leaped beforehand for your advantage, will knock your ass down one floor, resulting in arduously traversing the hell back up, at which point the fight starts all over with his life automatically replenished. And, of course, Aganum himself, who's more of a goddamn pussy by comparison, but can still zap you senseless should your agility and wits happen to shit the bed at any given time. Upon near defeat of the latter, he then warps you into the Dark World, along with Zelda herself, where, holy crap, more arduous quests await us. 
thought it was over by this point, consider yourself in for the biggest wake-up call ever. Other bosses within said alternate plane prior to facing that jackass yet again. The Helmasaur King in the Dark Palace. Argus in the Swamp Palace. Mothula in Skull Woods. <clears throat> that would be Mothula. Blind the Thief in the Gargoyle's Domain. Cold Stare in the Ice Palace. Vitreous in Misery Mire. And Trinex in the Turtle Rock Dungeon. You mean Trinex. And by this point, you pretty much get the gist of those confrontations. However, even those scatterbrained dildos don't compare to what's in store for Link at the very end. Ha, you bet your ass. Anyways, in the true fashion of the first NES outing, the fate of your quest continuation depends on which area you're in. Should your ass get wiped out in the Hylian Outworld, you're given the choice to continue either within your house, at the Sanctuary to the north, or within the Old Man's Cave atop Death Mountain, that is, if you've made it that far. You'll even be sent back to the beginning of your current dungeon, or even atop the Dark World Pyramid, if you got wiped out anywhere within either of these areas. As far as the immensely reinforced control setup, it might seem like a hell of a lot to absorb, even during a first-ever playthrough, one might add. But as far from humdrum, thanks to Link's rather dexterous sense of mobility and combat attrition methods, and as always, should any unexpected harm transpire, it's mostly due to user error. In other words, it's my own goddamn fault. And as one might expect, the same could be said for the progressive and apparent, yet sometimes mind-boggling, signature gameplay procedure. Challenge them to follow? While it's not as overwhelming as its two predecessors, I wouldn't go so far as to let its charming, cartoonish nature fool you in the least. Like every kick-ass classic out there, Link's latest 16-bit pilgrimage starts out standard and gets progressively painless. But my dear gentle Christ, it'll shred your intellect like a row of tabs on a Fender Stratocaster. Of course, if there's one hint I'm more than inclined to throw out there, in the light world, there's a fortune teller that will inform you of your next course of action should you happen to be stumped at any given moment at the cost of some spare rupees. The most common hardships involve the later dungeons, mostly in terms of enduring, adjusting, and or figuring out their extreme, intricate, and strict structures in tandem with the various multitudes of adversaries, the latter of which I advise referring back to. I'm looking at you two again, Ice Palace and Turtle Rock Dungeon, and even the corresponding end boss patterns that'll provide you with 90,000 death warrant signings and counting, complete with 80 shades of the red ass. But as long as you're aware enough of which items to use in a specific situation, distinguish which hidden areas contain necessary add-ons, some of which can become an extremely prolonging ordeal in and of itself to seek out, and to top it all off, which specific areas to warp between both the light and dark worlds, as mentioned previously, along with every other hint provided when I discussed the first Zelda game, the latter half, paraphrasing a Clockwork Orange, should not be much of a pain in the gulliver, given that you can access your map at any time, except in houses and shops of course, and is all around more of a spring breeze thanks to the tremendously advanced combat attrition system, in concurrence with the absence of the first NES game's cryptic-ass nature. And before I forget, there's even a plethora of new minigames which Link can participate in to score more rupees or extra hard pieces, or to just flat out kill time preparing for what the hell lies ahead. Just like the previous two Zelda installments, and especially Link's Awakening, no matter how many times you are wiped out, all your items and stats are still retained, assuming you've saved your progress as often as necessary. As far as graphics go, such is the case with every other Super NES game at the time, the presentation's much more radiant and dazzling than ever before due to its use of eye-pleasing hues, and a whole lot more. Outdoing its two NES predecessors, aka canonical follow-ups, by thrice the combined weights of Pendulite and Rush Limbaugh, and by five times the G-force of a goddamn rocket launch, a shit ton of meticulous detail has been administered throughout every unmistakable set-piece and landscape, not only throughout Hyrule itself, in both the light and dark worlds, but most of its surrounding regions, and the interiors of its corresponding buildings and chambers, the animations of the key characters, not only Link himself, despite the obvious hair color change, but also supporting peers and opposing cast of rivals, have been provided a well-deserved yet extravagant improvement beyond even our wildest imagination. And don't even get us started with the coherent dialogue provided throughout, which, for the record, knocks even those of its two predecessors out of both Yankee Stadium and Fenway Park combined, and zillions of light-years right past Uranus, Vulcan, Tatooine, Hoth, Planet X, and even more on Mountain and Duck World. The dungeons and caves in and of themselves have also been drastically cultivated, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes there, especially their sophisticated yet flexible interior layouts, and of course their aggressive as fuck end bosses. God help us if there isn't much more to convey about this game's visuals that hasn't already been done so who knows how many motherfucking times over. Music and sound them to follow?
With good old Kondo once again taking the helm, the soundtrack has also been greatly reworked, starting with the signature Hyrule Overworld slash Lynx theme, alongside with the introduction of new, if sometimes all too familiar, tracks being provided in appropriate, applicable moods depending on which incident you're involved with. And my god, does their sense of variety flesh itself the hell out. From the tranquil symphonies of the Kakariko Village theme, the mesmerizing fortune teller theme, all the way to the calamitous light world and dark world dungeons, the dark world itself, skull woods, and end boss slash Ganon confrontation anthems, most of which are the tip of the iceberg in my book, despite being recently put to shame by another later title in the series. Whose name won't be thrown out here, oh shit no. Must I also mention the enhanced sound effects have a whimsical yet intense fervor only Kondo can bring to the table like nobody else, including Link's trademark damage grown. Replayability wise, ranking several notches higher than its precursors, due to the majority of the key elements, redeeming factors, learning curves, and various tidbits we've approached thus far, not to mention all the high praise and regard that has been embracing for countless years upon years, for example the number 2 spot in Screw Attack's Top 20 Super NES Games Countdown. You'll be begging for more surprises as you strive to seek out and reconnect this obligatory link to the past. Bottom line, consider your life worth Donkey Dick without this memorable 16-bit masterpiece. Final exhibit, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, released for the Game Boy not long after. intended to be a port of a link to the past, this was eventually matured into an original concept under Tezuka's supervision, alongside that of Miyamoto and the late Hiroshi Yamauchi, complete with a fully fleshed out storyline and script by Yoshiaki Koizumi and Kensuke Tanabe, respectively. Riley Sky 100, if you'll do the honors? Taking place after A Link to the Past, and especially Oracle of Seasons and Ages, the latter two of which weren't released until eight years later, we see Link sailing out at sea to further his combat skills. Then a thunderstorm sidetracks him within his own boat. Moments later, his near comatose body is discovered by a local island girl who bears quite a striking resemblance to the princess, when in reality, it's not really her, although that would have been a nice twist, and she goes by the name of Marin, along with her dad, Terran. According to the former address deuteragonist, the location within which Link regains his consciousness is not anywhere within Hyrule this time, oh shit no. Instead, he now traverses and gets around on the faraway peninsula of Koholan's Island, guarded by a mythical being known as the Windfish. Speaking of, Link's main goal, after meeting another key character yet to be discussed, and by now, it should be obvious, is to travel through not only the entire island itself, but through its eight different dungeons, and recover the instruments of the Sirens, in order to not only awaken the aforementioned creature, but to eventually depart from Koholan's. Shifting gears as usual to the main gameplay aspect, you know the drill, R.S. In theory, it's the same routine as in A Link to the Past, and with the NES game. To be more basic and specific, it's the Diet Coke edition of the former, in that while Link sports the same migration and offensive capabilities, almost everything's been dumped down regarding the overall exploration structure and control mechanics. Just like the first NES entry, you're only limited to traveling between each individual screen regardless of your desired direction, and you can assign your desired weapons and items to either or both the B and A buttons upon accessing the traditional inventory menu, depending on the situations that call the most for them as you'll be constantly relying on this mechanic more often than you think. Shit, Metal Gear much? And to quote the late Richard Dawson, you better fucking get used to it. Upon commencement, when Link regains his consciousness, both his sword and shield are back in his possession yet again, thanks to the efforts of Terran, and after sojourning from their house and further down south near the island's shores to reach the item, our guardian owl flies, laying down all the details in terms of Link's main slew of objectives. 
In order to reach the first dungeon, namely the Tail Cave located south of Mape Village, not to mention every later one thereafter, there are certain Core Catch-22 objectives that you must accomplish. In the mysterious forest to the north, the key to the Tail Cave, hence the Tail Key, must be reached by finding and bringing the Sleepy Toadstool Mushroom from the other side of one of the caves, delivering it to the Witch at her hut further east to have it brewed into a magic powder, which, by the way, is used for lighting dark areas via the Brasiers, just like the lamp and the fire rod in the previous game, and finally distract that random jackass raccoon with it. And wouldn't you know, it was none other than Terran all along, dumb bastard. Oh, just for the record, be prepared to run into this Mario wannabe a lot. Anyways, hijinks aside, upon finally having the tail key, it's back to the old tail cave, and it's at this very juncture that you're able to access it. I know, about goddamn time, right? From there, the standard, customary labyrinth cavalcades apply here, not just acclimating to their individual structures and rounding up each vital key for locked doors in tandem with their maps and compasses, the latter of which, in this game's case, pinpoints the corresponding locations for each end boss, aka Nightmare, as well as indicates whether or not a key is found within a certain chamber, hence the four notes on it plays out heard in this sequence, like so. But also finding all new items in conjunction with familiar items making their comeback from its precursors to further beef up Link's inventory, and finally confronting and wiping out both their mini and main bosses, the latter aka the earlier addressed nightmares, to summon a halfway warp, should you feel the need to return later, and acquire each individual siren instrument at the end, respectively, in addition to the customary heart containers for Link's lifespan extension. <laughs> Engage in yet another side quest and or meet another important prerequisite to reach every next dungeon labyrinth on Koholans and wash, rinse, repeat. But that's not all that'll keep your goddamn senses fluctuating non-stop, oh fuck no. What say you, Riley Sky? Link's Awakening also features an all-new trading side quest in that it allows the young determined Highland warrior to recover his boomerang, starting with a purchase from the trendy game shop in Mave Village. What this gives rise to is starting with the Yoshi doll, which can be traded for a ribbon by a needy local mom. Next, a can of dog food by Madame Meow Meow's Mini Chomp Chomp upon donation of the ribbon. Then a supply of bananas by Sale, a gator pirate merchant near Cohillan's South Shore, upon turning over the can. A wooden stick by Kiki the Monkey after he and his motley crew of simians build a bridge connecting the Kalanet Castle <coughs> that we can -like castle. at the cost of those same bananas. It's pretty much completing one tedious task after another, similar to the gift system in Onimusha 2 Samurai's Destiny. New to Link's stockpile, apart from the traditional gear, are the rock's feather for jumping over gaps, or larger ones in tandem with the Pegasus boots found within the tail cave, the five golden leaves separated and spread out through Kalina Castle. Damn it, I said it's Kalina Castle! Some within, others outside, all of which upon recovery allows Richard to reveal the buried slime key's path for the key cavern outside his villa within the Yukuku Prairie, and even the debut of the ocarina itself, which is similar looking to the flute from the previous game, which is found within the Dream Shrine, great for learning three new tunes in order to experiment with various effects. Two temporary attack and defense boost, the Pierce of Power, and the Guardian Acorn, acquired from random enemy drops, both of which are only effective until Link reaches near death, as well as the Stone Slab Fragment in each dungeon, which provides specific clues on how to preserve throughout in terms of enemy and boss confrontations, to name several. Dude, the word you're looking for is persevere. And since we're on that particular subject, the same old adversary and hazard assortments are back, with newer ones meshed into the fray, as many might expect. Octoroks, both normal and flying, beetles, normal and spiny, the usual telltale bush and rock crawlers, tektites, moblins and big warriors, buzz blobs, which as usual turn into cucumin when exposed to the magic powder, sea urchins, sand crabs, piranhas and anglerfish, dark nuts, blade traps, bubbles aka anti-fairies, sparks, like likes, leavers, pincers, crows, keenies, both normal and giant, likewise with the Gaponga swamp flowers, zombies, pulse voice, stolfos, arm mimics, whiz robes, and mass mimics to name several, with the latter being reminiscent of Shy Guys from Mario 2 aka Doki Doki Panic. And speaking of which, remember the Yoshi doll we addressed a while ago? Expect a lot of Mario cameos, cause Nintendo. And for the sake of time, let's not even get ourselves started with the Warren Kirby lookalikes either. Concerning Link's dungeon itinerary and their corresponding boss confrontations, there's Rolling Bones, followed by the return of the menacing Moldorm in the aforementioned Tail Cave, a giant Hinox, followed by the genie in Gopunga Swamp's Bottle Grotto, two Dodongo Snakes, followed by the Slime Mine in the Key Cavern, Cue Ball, reminiscent of Argus from A Link to the Past, followed by the Anglerfish in the Angler's Tunnel near Taltal Heights Waterfalls, Master Stolfos, whom you'll be running into a lot, by the way, followed by the Slime Meal in the Catfish's Maw near Martha's Bay, to name several. 
And by now, as always, the routine should be nothing more than second fucking nature. God help us if it's not. Anyways, notwithstanding the customary fluid, unvarnished control schematics and gameplay formula, in the case of the aforestated constant weapon swapping based on corresponding button assignments, while some happen to perceive it as a virtue, others, Christ, if many, tend to view it as a nerve-wracking hindrance stemming from one tedious ordeal after another. Also, must I mention that Link's sword is now in randomized 90-degree arc patterns, whether facing horizontally or vertically, and that saving is done by not only dying, but resorting to the traditional Game Boy Reset trick, you know, start, select A and B simultaneously. Hence these two provided menus shown here following said outcome. Challenge Riley's guy. Despite turning out to be a tad more menacing this time around, more or less the same level as before, you won't have to be concerned about too much in the way of striving to meet each and every new objective, let alone getting the hang of the alternative side quest. And since we're on that frame of reference, there's also these secret seashells discovered within the most obscure, if unambiguous at times, areas of Kohilant. The most notable of which being the grassy field in Mae Village. Should you happen to rack up a heavy amount, not only will you score extra ones in advance, your main sword receives a well-deserved boost upon nabbing the 20th and visiting the hut, so make every effort count. Oh, a few other tidbits we forgot to specify. Upon leaping into any warpad, Link can shift to any previously embarked region of Koholand, depending on the magnitude of his quest, hence why it's always important to remember your place. Also, feel free to refer back to the constant, tedious button-based item swap-a-thons and the saving via resetting and or dying trick, since there won't be a rehash of these tactics, oh no. And while we're at it, amongst many tips to bear in mind, apart from what's been already established, be sure to equip your required accessory in advance if you wish to avoid that repetitious-as-fuck reaction message. Like, seriously, Link, we get it! SHUT THE FUCK UP! Anyways, graphics Riley's guy. For a mid-lifespan Game Boy gem, in spite of being downgraded from A Link to the Past, the ambitious detail never disappoints a smidgen, and hell, most may argue that the DX color version surpasses what we're looking at, thus sweetening the expectations even more. Not only are most of the key characters still as predictable as ever- You mean perceptible as ever! Likewise with the surrounding coherent regions, the supporting characters, and even the opposing, vindicate charade of rivals- Vindicate charade? More like the opposing vindictive cadre of rivals! Even the cutscenes are a sight for sore eyes, most notably Link's struggle for dear life at the beginning prior to being exposed to the fateful, unexpected storm, and especially his romantic moments with Marin halfway through the game. <laughs> John Cusack, Anthony Michael Hall, the late Corey Haim, or Gabe Jarrett much? And we can't possibly forget about the iconic stone tablet in Southern Face Shrine, depicting the fate of Kohilant if Link fulfills his ultimate aim. All in all, notwithstanding how baffling the limited dialogue can become at times, and how randomized the secrets can appear to many, the visuals are captivating. Music and sound-wise, as always, composed this time around by Minako Hamano, later of Super Metroid fame, alongside Kazuo Ishikawa of Warrior Land 1, 2, and 3, and especially the cancelled Star Fox 2. As much as I immensely get a kick out of the new Link slash Hyrule arrangement, first heard upon retrieving the sword near the Toronto shores and in later intervals, it pretty much overstays the shit out of even its own goddamn welcome, regretful as it is to throw out there. Same spiel with the calm, tranquil Owl Messenger theme and the temporary power-up jingle. Everything else isn't half bad, however, especially the various dungeon themes, the Dream Shrine theme, the dungeon mini-boss and nightmare anthems, and even the differentiating arrangements of the in-game exclusive, The Battle of the Windfish, enacted by not only Marin herself, but also by the various instruments of the sirens that Link recovers following the annihilation of each pissant nightmare boss. Despite the sometimes irritating nature of the sound effects, they're anything the hell but, not gonna lie here. <laughs> Replay Valley Riley Sky? While it doesn't have as much value as A Link to the Past, but because of how it performed commercially and critically, Link's Awakening is a must-have, and has much to offer in its replayability, both the Game Boy and Color. However, if you're looking for that meter to be stretched out a bit further, the Color version is the one to obtain. You have done well, my leech. You'd be off your fucking rocker to even contemplate skipping over this handheld outing, not to mention its more Radiant DX Color version, which for the record will be included in the Honorable Mentions Altar. And now it's time to wrap things up. Henceforth, what's our final verdict on this prestigious, prolific lineup here? There are absolutely no words, no words to further express our immortal, everlasting appreciation for such a thriving, timeless, and exalted franchise as this, and how it's been resonating with countless adventurous fans the world over for many a generation. On the usual overall crude but simplistic scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate all four. And by now, you pretty much get the gist of it all.
But anyways, if you happen to be on the search for a refreshing, norm-breaking, if at times poignant and erratic, series of action-adventure RPG hybrids, look no fucking further than in Nintendo's Legend of Zelda. Concerning the first two NES titles, in addition to the classic NES series ports on the Game Boy Advance, the previously recounted Four Swords port of A Link to the Past, and the immensely faithful DX Game Boy Color port of Link's Awakening, they're also available in the GameCube Collector's Edition, alongside the two N64 installments, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, and on the Wii, Wii U, and especially the DS, DSi, and 3DS's virtual consoles for any and all current to next-gen enthusiasts out there. Regardless of your preferred medium, all are a rapturous, lament-free indulgence to cherish through and through, and are well worth everyone's time, efforts, and a whole lot more. So what are you waiting for? The release of Breath of the Wild on the up-and-coming NX? Hunt them down, download them, do whatever's necessary to indulge in, and treasure these timeless titles. I assure you, you'll be left with the most satisfying air of exhilaration and merriment, like nothing else. Before I go, as always, I'd like to take yet another one of these special opportunities and thank Lil Sarah R, Okie Dokie, M. Defala, Watch Out, and especially Riley Sky 100 for my first ever unforgettable multi-star studded collaboration. I'm Riley Sky. Until next time, see you all later. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.